because of that supposed relationship with God. And when I say suppose, I don't mean to discredit it, I'm just saying that I'm being more objective and looking at this thing. There were things like growth in holiness. There were things like enlightenment would happen in an Eastern approach. You were on a path of some kind. My sense was if we could focus on that human side of the spiritual quest, we might then be able to do something with spirituality and understand what it is about and how it works in us and let God do God's thing and not worry about it because the fact is we can't do anything about it anyway. If there is a God, God is working. If there isn't a God, things are going on anyway. That question in some ways becomes moot, at least from the approach that I'm taking. So I want to share with you my understanding that I've come to to try to understand spirituality as a basically human thing, that everyone in one extent or another is spiritual, and if you choose can also look for spirituality, which means to pursue that spiritual that is part of being a human being. If this would be the case, then, I would like to suggest for people who are in health care and others as well, without getting into religious issues or things that seem perhaps obviously spiritual, a million different times during the day you can be doing things that address the concerns of treating spirituality in health care. That's what I'm promising and hoping to be able to show you as I go through this workshop. I begin by proposing an understanding of the human being. I'm going to spend a good bit of time saying what I understand spirituality to be. And it's going to be rooted in what a human being is. And to make that connection, I'm going to have to argue that human beings are spiritual by their very nature. And I don't mean that we're divine. I don't mean that we share in some ultimate. I mean just looking at what we are and how we operate. There's a basis to speak of spirituality. Most models of the human being that are used are bipartite. In psychological circles, even now, in the standard textbook, the model is body and mind. In religion, they'll say body and soul. I don't think it's important at this point to try to sort out what the difference are because those terms are both very, very fuzzy, and they're used in different ways. I would like to suggest that this is too simple that we are already at a point where we can differentiate within the mind at least two different things, and so that we can end up with a tripartite model. Body, or to be more exact about an organism, because we're speaking of a biological living body, biologically alive. Psyche and spirit, two dimensions of mind. My task is to clarify especially what I mean by spirit and you'll see it then in contrast to what we mean by psyche. And if I can ground it, what I'm saying in some kind of evidence, you might agree with me that you are spiritual, I am spiritual. In fact, what we are doing here, this realm of ideas and meanings and values that are going on right now between us, is a spiritual phenomenon. Let me say something just briefly about psyche. This is what we know most about and what psychology for the most part deals with. In fact, psychology is dealing with mind, so it's dealing with spiritual things too, but they're not differentiated, and the field tends to, to mix them together. I'm saying that by sorting them out, not separating them, we will never separate our spiritual dimension from our psychic dimension, from our biological dimension. And even as I'm saying that, you'll recognize Frankel's tripartite model. This parallels very, very much with what he is doing, so it should be familiar for most of you who are uh, familiar with Frankel. The psychological part has to do with emotions, it has to do with imagery in the mind, it has to do with memory, it has to do with things like personality structures, those things that make us operate in particular fixed, predictable ways to some extent or another. The spirit is a more transcending dimension, transcending in the sense that it's not locked into what I remember from my past, to what I happen to be feeling, to what images I have but something that will take me beyond all that. There's something within us that pushes us beyond. I want to see if I can give you some idea of what I mean by the human spirit. Most fundamentally, it could be categorized as and that which is experience. Notice I'm being empirical. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm not presenting this as revelation. In your own self, 
there is a dimension that comes across as wonder, marvel, awe. In fact, Kirk Schneider is doing a thing on awe somewhere down the line here that I'm wondering what he's saying. <laughs> awe. Th that sense of awe points within us wonder, questioning, to a, a sense in which we are beyond ourselves. There's something in us that is always leading us beyond what I already am. Sometimes it's spoken of the difference between the I who am acting and the me about whom I could speak. But even as I'm speaking about myself and telling you that I'm Daniel Helminiak and I was a Roman Catholic priest and I'm teaching now at the university, there is an agent who was saying all that. And now I can step back and talk about Daniel, who was talking about himself. And then I can step back, even as I'm talking about that Daniel who was talking about himself, talking about himself, on another level, I am still aware and can bring up to objectification that Daniel that I was not talking about. There are two levels of awareness going on. As I'm specifically aware of something on another mode, there is a level of awareness that I could bring up to explicit objective awareness. It's because of that distance that we have wonder. There's, we know more than we know. We're aware of more than we can say. Question arises in that distance between what is already objectified and, this, and our very being that is leading us beyond ourselves. One of the ways this shows, an easy way to talk about it, is to look at questioning. The good example is little children who will ask why, 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 why until you send them to school and they learn to memorize and pass the exams. And then you suppress in them their natural spiritual curiosity that would not be happy until it understood everything about everything. And where would one be if one would are able to allow the inner capacity to understand everything about everything? Does anybody recognize that phrase, relate it to something? What would you be, where would you be if you understood everything about everything? Okay, that is, you would be God in, in traditional Western theology. Which is to say, what I'm talking about points in those directions. I can say almost everything people say about spirituality without ever invoking God because I'm appealing to a principle that in its very nature is geared in that direction. Or we want to love, to love all that is lovable. Our loves are petty and small, and it's painful to know how difficult it is sometimes to get out of ourselves, yet there's something that wishes to go out and to embrace all that is good and worthwhile. And again, if we loved everything that is lovable, we would have attained that ultimate fulfillment. I'm suggesting that just by looking at questioning and how it works gives you an example of how this dimension of our minds is at work and it is spiritual. One of the other kinds of questions it asks is the big question. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What's going on? And I think in the little overhead, the introduction that I gave, uh, the health questions, in a health crisis. Why this? Why now? Why me? Why anything? You see, those are spiritual questions. They even sound like religious questions. Those are the kinds of questions that religions address. I'm saying they're not religious questions, they're human questions that express themselves in religion and in many different forms of religion. But the core underneath that is basically human. And if the answer turns out to be God, that is a suggested answer to a basically human question. The empirically grounded issue is the human question of what's going on in us, not the supposed answer that we proposed. The, the most beautiful example I have of the human spirit was when I was in Washington, D.C. a number of Fourth of Julys ago celebrating American independence and worked my way up the mall with a friend to get as close as we could to where the, the epicenter of the fireworks were. And, and on the way, we came to a cross street where we had to start, stop, and there was a young family there, a man and a woman and two children, and they were little. Some people should never be parents. The parents were concerned that the children were disturbing people because they were making noise 
as the fireworks went off. And the children would go, ooh, ooh and they shut up, shut up, be quiet, you're disturbing everyone. But, oh my God. What were they doing to those children? They were destroying and suppressing the very thing that I'm talking about. The excitement, the wonder, the marvel that leads us to move off beyond where we are now, to transcend our own selves into some further developments. The little girl would not be undone. I don't know if she was six, seven years old. One of this magnificent firework went off, and she yells out at the top of her voice, Mommy, Mommy, I want to shoot up into the sky and pop! <laughs> What's going on there? What was she experiencing? What was that expressing? There was not some distant academic scientific objectivity. Isn't that an interesting firework with a dimension of this and colors of that? She had somehow wanted not only to observe and enjoy, but to become it to be it, to experience in such its fullness that she was it, which is exactly what we do when we know things, when we understand things, when we love one another. There are dimensions in which we become that. I did my doctoral dissertation in theology on we are one body in Christ. What does that mean, that we actually become one? Which is just to say, I could go into a lot of detail on that if you want it. I'm just suggestively at this short uh, one-hour lecture giving a suggestive thing that in some ways we become, the meanings make us be what we are. And again, with the existential uh, psychological stuff, that will already resonate with many of you. We are constituted by meaning. Our world is constituted by meaning and motivated by values. We do not live in a sheerly physical world. Every physical object that you can name, by, even by naming it, has added significance, meaning to that object. And what you relate to is not the object. A dog could pee on this and pee on that, and it would make no difference. But a chair is not the same thing as a table, even though I could jump up here and sit on this, and then it would have become a chair. It's the meanings that make us who we are and make things what they are. We live in a meaningful world, which is to say we live in a spiritual world. Let me attempt to summarize some of what I've been saying about spirit. I'm saying that it is a dimension of the human mind. It is characterized by wonder, question, marvel, awe, and this issue of self-awareness is at the root of that. Uh, it leads us to ponder the big questions. Why, how come, where to? It has us construct meaningful worlds. We live in worlds of credos and commitments, in worlds of meanings and values. Uh, this dimension of the mind is built in, strictly human, it's dynamic, it's always moving, unless we learn to suppress it, which we do in many ways. It's open-ended. It will not rest until it rests in all that there is to be known and loved. And it is self-transcending. I throw this last one in just to throw in a spiritual term. So it sounds like what I'm talking about is spiritual. <laughs> That's talking about what the human spirit is. I have another way of imaging this. I present multiple images so that you can stop thinking about images and start grasping meanings. I want to shift you from psyche to spirit so that even what we're doing is spiritual because you can't do spiritual things on physical analogies. They will never work. And so I had one image. Here's another image of what I'm speaking of. A model of the human being as organism, psyche, and spirit. Notice, by the way, the popular thing, body, mind, and spirit, and why I would disagree with it. If I say spirit, mind is psyche and spirit, then what is this spirit added on to the human mind, except another way of smuggling God and religion in? And when people say body, mind, and spirit, and attend to the spiritual, they mean attend to your religious issues, which I have nothing opposed to that, and that's certainly how most spiritual issues get attended to. But the model obscures what's really going on there from my perspective. If you look at what spirit is about, a shortcut, a, a shorthand way of speaking of what it is at stake, meanings and values. I have to say in this context, by meaning, I don't believe I'm meaning the same thing as the conference's meaning when it says meaning. 
generally when we say meaning here, we're meaning significance, right? What reference does it have to me? What importance? What the, that already includes values. Significance bottles up meanings and values. I'm using meaning in a strictly cognitive sense, such as credos or beliefs or understandings or visions or dreams. These are getting more poetic. I'm using values then as the value component, commitments, ethics, evaluations, virtues, promises. These are strict parallels. I'm looking for different ways, two-part ways of saying the same thing to attempt somehow to strike your imagination that you'll catch what I'm meaning. There are two basic facets. They correlate with the, the old medieval issue of intellect and will, if you, ha if you would. Knowing and loving. So love is in here, though I don't think I use that term. I use dreams and promises when I'm doing sexuality and spirituality. Lovers have dreams and they make promises to one another. Uh, the one last point I want to make on this, having given you some idea of what I'm meaning by the human spirit, is that it is, if I can use the gross image, it's encased or supported by psyche and organism. And in some ways this is an evolutionary model presuming that we're moving up the species and we become more sensate and more eventually spiritual. And that's another whole point for argument and debate, but you can get some idea of what's going on in there. The, the point about the psyche is that it constrains as well as supports the functioning of spirit. Let me see if I can tell you what I suggest what I mean by that. If, if one of the core fa facets of the psyche is emotions, Notice how emotions will either help or hinder our spiritual functioning. So that if I am a very fearful person, is it likely that I will be open and dynamic and growth-filled? No. If I'm a person who's very confident, it's much more likely that I'll be willing to let that dynamism of my own being have free reign. If I'm in deep sadness, again, there's going to suppress the whole of this functioning and prevent it from working. Whereas if I'm a person filled with joy on some occasion, the delight and marvel will just open me up to transcendence. If I'm a person of grandiosity and pride, I'm likely going to be closed-minded and rigid in what I'm doing and there will be no movement. Whereas if I'm a person of humility and willing to question and ask and, and repent and to ask forgiveness for mistakes, that kind of a person is much more likely to be able to allow the spiritual possibilities to emerge. What I'm suggesting is there's an interaction between the psyche and the spirit, both helping and constraining each other. The spirit can loosen up the psyche. Loosening up the, uh, the psyche can also let the spirit go through. Psychotherapy, for the most part, in my understanding, a lot of it will emphasize the emotional component, and by shifting and freeing the emotions allow growth to occur. Another approach is to address a more cognitive approach, which is into beliefs and understandings, which in some ways will shift one's being to allow the psyche to readjust. The ultimate goal is to get these all flowing in harmony, so that the basic structures of my being support the self-transcending dimension which is in my mind, and allows me to be open and growthful ongoingly, then you would have a totally integrated person and there would be the possibility of even experiencing the very dynamism of the spirit itself. And what would it be like if you got an experience of something that's totally open-ended, open to the whole universe? Is that mysticism? No God. Perhaps what it is that mystics experience is their own being a marvel and wonder of the human mind itself and its spiritual component. And there's no way to talk about it, so we put otherworldly words on it, otherworldly names, as if we knew what we were talking about when we start talking about otherworldly things. I've been proposing a model of the human being that includes spirit in it. I'm suggesting that on that basis we can begin to talk about the, most of the issues that people deal with when they talk spirituality without involving God or religion. Religion is good enough, but when I say God, people get really upset. I mean, you take God out of spirituality, is that possible? I'm suggesting how that might be done. 
This looks then to be a psychological basis that could allow us not only to talk about people having spirituality and how important they are in their lives, but how they work. What's at stake in it? What are the structures? What are the mechanisms? How does one grow in that? What I didn't hear when I was in seminary, and they gave me all these talks with theobabble, and I didn't know what that stuff meant. I'm suggesting some understanding of that. I want to take a, about three minutes to have you talk with one another. What am I saying? What are you getting out of this? What is it meaning to you? Take some time among yourselves, please. And then we'll have a, a bit of time for questions. Let me stop that for a minute. Okay, sure. May as well turn it over, actually. Should we stop this? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to set a time. What's that? We're going to set a time for you to be available for a conversation in a hospitality suite. Sure. Okay, I'll go look at the schedule. Maybe come back with suggestions. Yeah, and what do I? Do? Uh, let me begin to call us together again. Mm -hmm. well, we can, yeah, we can work on that out. Okay. We don't have to. We don't have to break through into twelve because we were delayed to begin. Okay. All right. Let, let us uh, get together. There are a couple of housekeeping announcements because of our time scheduling. We're going to go at least until noon, or. And then we're, we've got a table in lunch if someone wants to come and sit and talk a little bit around lunch. That would be another way to do that. Uh, there was one. Let, let me just, three, four questions that came up in your discussion that really seem critical that need addressing. about independent 
I didn't hear spirit in what you said. Well, but, that's, that's the question. Okay. What is the spirit beyond cognition, beyond the, the, the sense of... Oh, good question. Let me, let me say that what beyond cognition, because when I use that term, I risk being misunderstood. I'm using the work of Bernard Lonergan, L-O-N-E-R-G-A-N, Canadian a philosopher, theologian, methodologist, died in about 19, in 1984, said to be one of the geniuses, certainly one of the Catholic geniuses of the 20th century. I'm using his work, his basic work is Insight, a Study of Human Understanding. And that is where he analyzes what is this capacity that I'm talking about. He speaks of it more generally in terms of consciousness, but he means by that a very specific facet of what most people mean when they say consciousness. He also uses the word spirit once in a while to talk about it. Uh, if you look at just the title of his book, what's the difference between insight and information? Cognitions and the very process of understanding that the thing that I'm talking about is not just a thing that comes down to information and processing logically of information, but doing leaps of understanding that leaves uh, logic lagging behind. It's the, in, it's the uh, reasons of the heart that the reason does not know. There's another, the, the self-transcending dimension I'm talking about opens up into ways that merely talking about logic and rational discourse is certainly a part of, but misses the most important part of human intelligence, the fact that we have insights. That's a brief answer to what... Yeah. Well, I'm a cognition in the larger sense that already includes the understanding of insight or the perception of progress or, or, or leaps of understanding. So there's two ways of thinking. There's the logical and there's the uh, perceptual or whatever. And I thought Okay, well then maybe we're speaking on the same realm. Were there, were there other questions? Anybody find a problem with what I'm doing? Yes, because we need to hear this. Okay, the adjective, uh, spiritual starts becoming an adjective, and I'm talking about the spiritual making it into a noun. The problem is that English does not have words to sort out what I'm talking about, and I've struggled with that. In my book, I have a, two pages on vocabulary and what we're going to do with it. Sometimes I've used the word noetic instead of spiritual, and that would resonate very well with the Frankel approach. And in fact, I have a comparison of it there. Uh, but I don't know who understands the word noetic, and it's already been co-opted by a number of different spiritual circles, and the dictionary definition of it limits it to cognition. There's nothing about evaluation in it. So it's a problem of vocabulary. Other issues that someone saw that... I'm at this point not talking about what is outside the person except the reality toward which all of reality, not specifically divine reality, which I think is the most difficult thing to talk about. I'm a, I'm a systematic theologian as well as a psychologist, so I have a very critical mind about anything to do with religion. Uh, I'm talking about what is in us. It's not that I am open to the spiritual. I am spiritual. Spirit is part of what I am, and it then leads me See, this, it, though I'm only talking about me, it's not a locked into oneself thing I'm talking about. Because the very thing I'm talking about, its very nature, is to go out. It's a self-transcending dimension. It is what makes us encounter what is. It's geared to all that there is to be known and loved, to being. Uh, I'm not... Okay... I'm not talking about something calling us from outside of us, but that becomes part of the, the problem. That's one of the issues at stake in the stuff I'm doing. Uh, if I'm talking about a teleology, because uh, I'm certainly geared going somewhere, I'm getting there by the honing device in here rather than trying to get there by positing what I'm going to find when I get to the end. 
That's what the God approach does. I tell you what God is, and then I gear you toward it. And in some places, I force you to go in that direction, which is my notion of where you ought to be going. I'm rather looking at something which I think is within us. It, it, that there are, and this is leading into the next point I want to make. Uh, and the question you're raising perhaps is getting to it. Did you, did you notice I never talked about good or evil, true or false? That's one of the issues that's going to come at stake where I think I move from the, 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 the uh, existential uh, psychology thing. That was the question I also asked Dr. Gardner in the other, in the other uh, session. Uh, if, if, uh, what, what, how do you know if this thing that is self-transcending, that's always asking a movie, is going in a right direction or not? Is it any self-transcendence is fine? I used to be a crook last week. This thing, I think I'm going to go out and, oh, become a, a, a pimp. I mean, you know, I, I've transcended myself. I'm into something new. I've moved beyond what I was. I, it, it, the, is there some homing device that puts this thing on a specific track? But it's not just that you have to find meaning. I will raise the question about whether your meaning is worthwhile or not. And the issue is, how do you propose criteria to determine what is worthwhile or not? That's what I'm hearing in your question. I don't know if you've meant all that, but that's, I'm, I'm, I'm moving out into that. I would like to suggest that uh, Lonergan's analysis is much more complicated than I proposed. I propose meanings and values as a shorthand way of talking about the two basic expressions of our human function, spiritual functioning. He actually has four levels or four facets, or four dimensions of spirituality. And he claims not only to have suggested them, but they are grounded in empirical evidence that this is a scientifically valid, final, necessary, and sufficient to account for the phenomenon. Now you should all be going, what the hell do you think you're saying up there? This is outrageous. <laughs> in any case, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's not I, he did it. <laughs> so I will blame him for this. <laughs> uh, let me just popularly say this. If what I'm talking about is an outgoing thing in us, if it's going to function, it has to be open. And to the extent that it gets shut down, it is not going to function. One of the universal criteria of human health and wholeness and holiness and rightness is open-mindedness. Uh, for some religions, I've been faulted on that. You require fundamentalists to be open-minded, you're countering their very religious beliefs. My answer, their religious beliefs are wrong. I'm just throwing this out to, to let you see, to catch, to, to catch the, the, the importance or the, the, the impact of what I'm saying. Open-mindedness. If this thing is, is going on and on, it has to be questioning. You have to be willing to pursue things. You have to wonder about stuff. And in the process, you have to trust your own intelligence. I'm up here saying all this stuff, and it sounds like nonsense to you. Don't think maybe that you just don't understand it. Maybe I'm wrong. And the reason you don't understand it is because it doesn't fit together. Trust your intelligence. That's another of the questions. And again, you have some religions that would say, oh, don't ask questions. Take it on faith. That's anti-spiritual. If you're further going to be able to let this thing progress, not only do you have to be open to the evidence and be willing to question it, you then have to be willing to question your own answer. Oh, I've got this idea. This looks really great. Is this right? Is this correct or not? I'm going to go on with this before taking questions because I'll never finish if I don't do that. I'm sorry. Uh, so that there's a further thing, to be willing to judge, make judgments, to be honest about the matter. That's what the criteria comes down to be. And be able to say, no, I made a mistake. This doesn't fit. Thank you for showing that to me. Or no, this does fit. What? There's, it covers all the bases. Is there anything we missed? We didn't miss a thing. Anything significant and relevant is already accounted for. This is it. The honesty of doing that. And finally, there's the existential, and I'm not using it in the same sense Lonergan uses it, but he means living life rather than living in your mind. Living life to him means existential. And it's not at all, I should never even have used that word in this context. <laughs> it's the question of living. What am I going to do about it? So that if this process is going to be ongoing, flowing, I have to act on what I know to be the case, 
and not act contrary to that, because if I act contrary to that, it's going to undo what I know to be the case. And I also have to act in such a way that will keep this thing going. What I'm suggesting is that this human spiritual dimension in us is what ethics means. It is what epistemology is about. Built into us are the very criteria of truth and the criteria of goodness. Those criteria, to put them up popularly, to be open-minded, to be questioning, pondering, wondering, and to be honest, will bring you to the truth. If I want to say this very popularly, it's the honest person who will know what the facts really are. If you're not an honest person, don't think you're going to come to know the facts. I don't find that somebody in the other room said there's no sense so uncommon as common sense in response to the lecture. And I said, my mother used to tell me that all the time. This is a common sense way of knowing it. If you want to know truth, you have to be honest. About, well, people come from different perspectives. We'll talk about it. We have different viewpoints. We'll sort them out. Do the hard work. But pursue the thing with openness, questioning, and honesty. And then you can claim there is such a thing as coming to know more and more what might be the truth. And finally, be good-willed or loving. Act what, uh, do what needs to be done in light of what you know and what keeps this process moving. Lonergan phrased these things, and here's another way, popular, be open, thoughtful, honest, and loving. And Lonergan's formulation itself, much more technical, uh, be attentive, open to the data, intelligent, that doesn't mean have a high IQ, it means use and trust whatever IQ you happen to have. Uh, be re reasonable, base your judgments on the evidence, and be responsible, act on what you know in such a way to keep this process moving. What I'm suggesting by this, that there are requirements of the human spirit, that, that one spirituality is not as good as any other spirituality. There are some things that are helpful and there are some things that are destructive. And to take this value-neutral approach, well, I'm going to be open to everybody's spirituality. You cannot do that in certain cases. The, the case that should have broken the camel's back was the flying of the planes into the World Trade Center if the Holocaust didn't do it. And other, I mean, how, what do we have to do to recognize you can't just neutrally sit back and agree that, well, that's your opinion, I respect it. There are certain things that don't respect, is it? Let me suggest, because it's been, uh, in terms of process and the timing on this, if we can do, create a pause at this point, we had reserved several uh, tables at the lunch period, and it's going to be said, and we can continue in terms of the open-ended. So is it okay to move to the practical? Okay, to wrap up? yeah, let me just, uh, to wrap up then. And which is to mean I'm going to have to apply this to health care. You see, I haven't said anything specifically about health. But I, I would suspect that those of you who are working in health care realize that the down-to-earth human things I'm talking about are in health all over the place. I gave you on the back of your handouts a list of issues that deal with health care. I mentioned fear, for example, and what fear does to a person. Merely to say, you'll be all right, it's okay and give some information. We're here with you. Calms a person, opens them up to new possibilities. That is a spiritual gesture. That is treating spirituality, apart from any specific religion, apart from any specific belief. It's that kind of stuff I'm seeing that would open up onto more practical applications. There's loads and loads more on this in my, uh, in my books, if you want those. I'm working on a popularization of it right now. We're doing a, a panel tomorrow at 2 p.m., a summit on spirituality, where this theory is going to be the target. And so if you want to come in and see if, what we can make of it, it's 2, two o'clock. Mm -hmm. And we'll be in the lunchroom. If some of you want to join us there, I'd be happy to discuss things with you. And I'll be happy to talk with you around the corridors as we run into each other. Thank you. Thank you.